Welcome to uh, the uh, next lecture in our ecclesiological series for this spring semester. The next uh, lecturer is uh, someone that I uh, would like to dearly introduce, not just for this lecture, but to our department for Eastern Christian Studies, uh, Sara Gilin, who's making her first semester in our department. Uh, Sara uh, had uh, started up with, as a doctoral student at Lunds University. But the recent research she has been doing is about the intersection of peace and feminist theology, but also uh, how to educate for peace, which means that it's a practical theologian that we are experiencing today, who wants to see results on the ground, and not just talking about theories, but also see a practical consequence of our theories. This highlights the important uh, part of the field of international relations and ecumenism, where uh, uh, Sara Galin has been appointed a senior lecturer precisely in the field of the practice of international relations and ecumenism. One of her expertise fields uh, are <coughs> receptive ecumenism. I won't describe it in detail here, it will be more than an introduction. But it's very much about how to realize unity from a behavioral perspective. And this is the intersection that I find with uh, Sorry Galim, the intersection between behavioral perspectives, practical perspectives, and systematic perspectives. And now she will talk about democracy and uh, uh, conciliarity. And the floor is yours, Dr. Galim. Thank you very much, Michael, for this introduction. <clears throat> so, uh, dear listeners and dear students, um, now here as a new lecturer at the, the university. Oh, sorry, <laughs> as an a, as a new lecturer at the University College Stockholm. Uh, this is my first lecture at the Department of Eastern Christian Studies. And I'm very glad to be here in this digital room today and to get the opportunity to speak with you about issues that concern conciliarism and democracy. And I look very much forward to our discussions then at the end of this session. Uh, as uh, you all might know, and as Michael also said something about, this lecture is part of the Ecclesiology semester. Uh, which involves the master program in international relations and ecumenism and therefore a certain part of the course literature for this semester makes a springboard for the reasoning here in the lecture today. Uh, this is uh, uh, particularly the books about conciliarism by two Pauls, Paul Avis and Paul Vallier. Uh, both of them approached the issue of conciliarism with a special view to the Anglican communion and to the role of the Lambeth conference uh, for the life of this communion. But today uh, we will make, uh, make our starting point in a setting which in geographical terms is much closer to ourselves, namely the region of Stockholm and the endeavors that were undertaken precisely here by ecumenical pioneers from east and west in the time of the interwar period, in other words, about 100 years ago. Today, uh, four years remain until we reach year 2025, and then a century has passed since Stockholm was visited by a, for that time, very diverse crowd of people when it comes to nationality and culture and confession. They were coming here to participate in a meeting which had the official name the Universal Christian Conference on Life and Work. But uh, among ecumenists, the conference was more often referred to as the Stockholm Gathering or simply the ecumenical meeting. Uh, the meeting became famous because it constituted an important starting point for the development of the international ecumenical life and work movement, which together with the faith and order movement founded the World Council of Churches in 1948, shortly after the end of the Second World War. 
while faith and order today constitutes one of the World Council of Churches different commissions, the life and work movement did not form a commission. Instead, I would say that its focus on Christian social ethics plays an important role in framing the general agenda of the World Council of Churches today. In other words, the engagement that inspired the ecumenical pioneers in Stockholm about 100 years ago still features ecumenical engagement in our time. So no wonder that Stockholm has remained a well-known place among ecumenists from all around the world. The meeting in Stockholm in 1925, it led up to the production of numerous books. The year after the meeting, uh, this volume let's see, uh, of conference proceedings um, was published and one could easily believe that this was the book uh, that was first published after the meeting. But sometimes one finds treasures that one didn't knew existed. Uh, during my time as a postdoctoral researcher in our neighboring country, Finland, I found this old and wonderful book in a church archive in Helsinki. Its title means Pages and Pictures from the Ecumenical Meeting in Stockholm, 1925. And it was actually about to be thrown away, <coughs> sorted out, uh, and I was lucky to find it before that happened. Uh, it is a compilation of photos and texts from the Stockholm meeting, and it was given out in the same year as the meeting in 1925, so even earlier than the conference proceedings. This is a book which mean, uh, which by means of a photo documentary and reports and narratives and direct references to speeches uh, somehow draws the reader right into the meeting and brings us face to face with the participants. During this lecture, I will share some photos from this book with you because the meeting in Stockholm and the people who gathered there they pose important question to, uh, questions to us about the meaning of conciliarism and its relation to democracy in the modern ecumenical movement. With their help and also in the company of Paul Avis and Paul Vallier, we will look back in history in order to get a deeper insight into both resources and complications in conciliarism. And it will lead us into discussions on the nature of discernment and decision making in the churches, but also into the role of ecumenical friendships and bridge building in a society that at that point of time was torn by national rivalries and polarizations and violent conflicts. And with regard to these kinds of tensions, which in many ways correspond with the polarizing trends in society today, the experiences and insights that were made by the ecumenical pioneers here in the capital region 100 years ago, they call for profound reflection. So having introduced you to the documentary book from 1925, I will now turn on a PowerPoint presentation. So I will share my screen with you. So, uh, and since I have had uh, in previous lectures a, a little bit of a bad sound when I share my screen, if my, I have my video on, I will also stop my video. So, <clears throat> okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Is, yes, good, okay. So, then we start with the arrivals. So in 1925, um, a situation, uh, it was a situation that was influenced by the tensions of the interwar period. And we can imagine that the very arrival of an international, multicultural and interconfessional 
crowd, like the participants of the Stockholm meeting, signalized the presence of a movement that countered the polarizing trends of the contemporary society. Many of the participants in the Stockholm gathering were active internationalists. For many of them, their ecumenical engagement went hand in hand with their internationalist outlook and their resistance to the widespread nationalism of that time. Several of the Protestant leaders who participated in the conference were inspired by their background in the Christian student movement and the internationalism that this movement nurtured. One of these former students was Nathan Söderblom, who is known as a main initiator of the Stockholm gathering. And you can see him here in one of the photos to the left, up to the left, together with the patriarch of Alexandria. At the time of the ecumenical meeting, Söderblom had been the Archbishop of Church of Sweden for 11 years. Here in Sweden, Söderblom is often brought to the fore as an ecumenical father and his central role in the foundation of the life and work movement has made him very well known in international ecumenical, in the ecumenical movement. Most participants in the ecumenical meeting in Stockholm were Protestants, just like Söderblom. But as we can see here from the pictures of their arri arrivals, some of the people who arrived here were Orthodox. And here we have uh, uh, two pictures, one from the procession to the inaugur inaugural service in the Dome of Stockholm and a photo from the concluding service in the dome of Uppsala, where we can see as a little spot in the very front uh, at the altar, the Patriarch of Alexandria. If the role of Söderblom, who was a Lutheran church leader, has been much attended to here in Sweden, it is important to complement this picture. Considering the immense impact of Orthodox ecumenical initiatives of that time. One initiative which formed an important background to the meeting in Stockholm did in fact come from Constantinople. In 1919, the Synod in Constantinople had formulated an encyclical which was sent out in 1920. This encyclical points to the recent achievement among the nations to form a union for peace through the League of Nations. In the light of this political achievement, the encyclical stresses the need for a similar union among the churches. That the churches needed to form a union of respect and love of one another. And we will now read some excerpts from this encyclical which is famous in the international ecumenical circles and has become known as the letter from Constantinople. So it says, that above all, love should be rekindled and strengthened among the churches so that they should no more consider one another as strangers and foreigners, but as relatives and as being part of the household of Christ and fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of God in Christ. By stirring up a right brotherly interest in the condition, the well being, and stability of the other churches, by readiness to take an interest in what is happening in those churches and to obtain a better knowledge of them, and by willingness to offer mutual aid and help many good things will be achieved for the glory and the benefit of both themselves and of the Christian body. Nor should they continue to fall piteously behind the political authorities who truly applying the spirit of the gospel and of the teaching of Christ have under happy auspices already set up the so-called League of Nations in order to defend justice and cultivate charity and agreement among the nations. The 
call for mutual aid, love and interest and of agreement and better knowledge about each other that we see here in the letter from Constantinople was a call that many ecumenists from different traditions conceded in during the interwar period. The proceedings from the Stockholm conference testifies to how this call was echoed in the discussions during the meeting. In reports and speeches, we can take part of the participants' deep concerns about the way that Christians from different nations are being drawn into and becoming subject to the rhetorics of national self-assertion and polarization and violence. The ecumenical endeavors in the interwar period for creating a Christian World Council need to be seen in the light of these worries. National divisions threaten to draw Christians apart and the gathering of an international crowd of church leaders in Stockholm in 1925, in other words, reflected a desire to counter the development that turned nations and thereby also Christians of different nations against each other. The call for mutual aid, love, interest and agreement, which was spelled out in the letter from Constantinople and which was also emphasized during the Stockholm meeting, gives us a glimpse of a flickering hope that existed among Christians who had just recently experienced the horrors of a world war and feared the outbreak of a new one. There was a conviction about that the gathering of a council would serve as a means for peace. And this brings us to the question of what internal logic that would steer the dynamics of such a council of churches. Nathan Söderblom addresses this question by using the language of music. In a sermon in the town of Mora in mid middle Sweden, several years before the Stockholm meeting, he said that, and I translate now from Swedish, God's orchestra is not unison. Every people, every church, is to be an instrument and when they all tune in there will be music. The metaphor of the orchestra it provides us with a quite merry picture of the churches who all contribute to the concert with their specific tunes and chords and voices. But of course the metaphor can also evoke some suspicious questions for example, of who might be rec recruited to the orchestra, which kinds of instruments that the music musicians are allotted, and who is playing the first fiddle. But a more fundamental question concerns the notion of unison. If the orchestra of churches is not unison, what level of discord is there room for? The music metaphors indeed take, take us to questions that are central to conciliarism. Conciliarism involves managing the realities of discord and concord, balancing different appeals to diversity and unity, and taking regard to both communal and personal aspects of Christian life and faith. If we listen to the reasoning of Paul Vallier and the way that he refers to Sankt Ignatius of Antioch, musical metaphors depict the context of communality in the early church. As Vallier points out, the metaphors of the melodious plenitude and liturgical ensemble counter an authoritarian discourse and illustrate the way that the early Christian church embodied a spirit of communalism, which in the, in the opinion of Valier puts most modern churches to shame. So if we follow Valier's discussions, it is in the context of strong communalism that we need to understand the development of conciliarism in the churches. It took place in a context 
of fellowship and collaboration. Conciliarism implies engaging many voices and bringing together the views of many eyes. It is indicative that the Latin word for council, concilium, derives from the words cilium for eyelid and con for with or together. Conciliarism is an exercise in seeing together. It aims at gathering many eyes in order to seek a common view, but also to see each other eye to eye. When discussing the meaning of conciliarism, Valier also points at the nature of church councils. And he explains that <clears throat> councils can be standing bodies, but that they also can be occasional gatherings, that they can be clerical assemblies, but that they also can be mixed assemblies of clergy and laity together. Sometimes they meet, their meetings are recorded and sometimes not. Councils may be large and influential or small and uninfluential. But as already mentioned, whatever form a council takes it is by necessity collaborative. It bring, brings together an abundance of voices and therefore it represents the so-called multi-unity of the church. And we will come back to this expression in a little while. Valier, he explains how conciliarism involves being called together. That conciliarism mirrors a central aspect of the very nature of the church, that the church is itself an assembly in worship and in many other expressions of life. In being called together, the council affirms the fellowship of the church and it reflects both its spiritual and its physical unity. Councils also remind Christians that the church is a real fellowship. It aims at preserving koinonia, which is often translated precisely as fellowship, besides other translations such as communion and community. Valier reminds us of the house churches in the time of the early church and that these were fellowships that mediated a sense of belonging and communalism. Since they regarded themselves as being called together by God in the household of faith, they were in dialogue and took counsel together. And the term conciliar mirrors the communal and binding character of their relationships. In ecumenical theology, the concept of koinonia is often used to describe the search for unity among the churches. But as mentioned, we are talking about a unity in multiplicity. Koinonia mirrors a fellowship which includes a multiplicity or, if you want, an orchestra of voices. With Valier, we learn about the way that the earliest councils of the church were meetings that took place in order to deal with challenges to the unity of the church. But at the same time, the conciliar practice meant to find ways of accommodating diverse elements through mediation. In other words, the unity that the early church sought for was neither monistic nor pluralistic, Instead, it was conciliar. And conciliar, conci conciliarity does not require uniformity and it does not exclude diversity. To sum up, conciliarity involves aspiring for gathering the many into a larger whole. In this way, we can see how well conciliarity attunes with the logic of the concept of Catholicity, which reflects precisely the dynamics between the simultaneous aspirations for unity and diversity in the life of the church, and which therefore is a central and widely elaborated concept in ecumenical theology. But conciliarism does not only 
correspond with the unity diversity dynamics of Catholicity. It also corresponds with its geographical outlook, while Catholicity reflects the wholeness of the church, including its parts in the whole world. Conciliarism does not simply refer to gatherings between believers in one specific place or fellowship, but from different places and different fellowships. Conciliarism is, in other words, translocal. And about being translocal, I give you here another picture from the book, which is the um, postcard of the Stockholm gathering 1925. And here we can see the way that the conference organizes, uh, that they, how they aim to gather people and voices from many places and even from all around the world. And Valier, he describes this dimension of conciliarism in very colorful terms. That conciliarism can be likened with keeping up the roots between islands in an archipelago or with settling the system of threads in a holy internet. But nevertheless, conciliarism is also an expression of discernment and decision making in the life of the churches. And here we see a picture from the presiding board in the plenary of the Stockholm Conference. Conciliarism means decision making, means councils, which are called together to resolve issues that affect the life and the ministry of the church. As such, conciliarism is one of the oldest means of decision making in the history of the churches. Councils have even been called signature institutions of the Christian tradition. And as Valier explains, councils have not played a secondary role in the history of the church. Instead, they have played an indispensable role in terms of coordinating and mediating. And if we look back to the early church, councils had by the end of the third century become an, an established, although not fully clarified, institution of church government. The aspect of government in conciliarism is a hot topic of discussion for both Paul Vallier and Paul Avis. Both of them have written their books with a view to the Anglican communion, and both of them discuss the pros and cons with being a worldwide communion of churches without a council that actually governs the entire communion. They highlight the role of the Lambeth Conference and they point to its gathering and advisory role, but also of its lack of possibility to take decisions for the part of the whole communion. Here we can draw a parallel with the life and work movement and the gathering in Stockholm in 1925. Its role was not to govern the churches, but to gather them for common discernment of shared visions, goals and guidelines and to advise their respective church communities according to these guidelines. Looking a bit further ahead in time, we can recognize this advisory and gathering function of the World Council of Churches. It does not govern its member churches. It has an advisory function for them. In spite of the absence of a governing function of the World Council of Churches and its forerunners, such as the life and work movement. Both Avis and Valier writes about the 20th century as an ecumenical golden age. Oh, sorry, I'm a little ahead here, sorry. <laughs> an ecumenical golden age, which contributed to a renaissance of uh, conciliarism. And here, both of them point to the Second Vatican Council of the Roman Catholic Church as the great event of the 20th century, century conciliar renaissance. But it is also worth to pay attention to the gathering of Orthodox and Protestant churches in the World Council of Churches. Now here it comes. Uh, 
With regard to conciliarism and democracy, the recent change of model for the council's decision making is interesting to say the least. Previously, decisions were made according to principles of parliamentary democracy and in other words according to majority vote. Today, it, in its larger assemblies and gatherings, the council applies a model of decision making that is based on discerning consensus. And the picture we see here is from the last General Assembly of the World Council of Churches in Busan in South Korea. And we can see here that many of the delegates, they raise their hands with a red piece of paper, which means that they are warm or positive to a suggestion. A blue paper would mean that they are cold or negative to a suggestion. The gathering does not end before all delegates are warm for formulation or decision or can, or can then bear with the opinion of a very large majority. Quite often documents from the World Council of Churches end with footnotes that express complementary or opposite viewpoints from delegates who in the end decided to bear with the opinion of an overwhelming majority. When Paul Vallier refers to this change of decision-making method in the World Council of Churches, he points to how this change fell back on grievances among the Orthodox members of the Council in the 1990s. And he also gives weight to their contribution to this new decision-making agenda. And he stresses that with this change, conciliarism actually stands out in greater continuity with its historical roots in the early church. In ancient Christian conciliarism, decisions were taken precisely in overwhelming majorities. The absence of such a great majority would cause conflict and schism. In other words, decisions were not taken by means of close votes, but instead in far-reaching agreement. The practice of consensus-based decision-making was a way of making peace and of strengthening the community. But these results were not merely seen as human political achievements, but as products of divine inspiration. Making decisions in consensus was a process of discernment that required spiritual guidance. And this is also the starting point for the consensus-based decision-making in the World Council of Churches today. It is considered to be a discernment process of a spiritual character. The change of model from parliamentary democracy and majority vote to the discernment of consensus is, in other words, not only about changing method. It means a step away from the effective procedures of the negotiation table, the achievement of majority vote, towards a much more time-consuming and thoroughgoing process of listening, learning and reflecting, which is characteristic of spiritual ecumenism. But in spiritual ecumenism today, the discernment of consensus is not the most debated phenomenon. In parallel with ecumenical endeavors for consensus, we see the development of an approach to discernment and decision making, which might appear quite opposite to consensus, namely the motto of agreeing to disagree or to reach a better quality disagreement. We find the proponents of this approach in a branch of spiritual ecumenism called receptive ecumenism, which is a type of spiritual ecumenism and which has its roots in the Roman Catholic Church. Receptive ecumenism is inspired by the method for interfaith um, dialogue called scriptural reasoning, where the need for better quality disagreement 
among people of different faith is seen as an essential way of contributing to create a more peaceful society. Receptive ecumenism agrees with the idea of striving towards a better quality disagreement among churches in conflict as a first step on a long journey towards a deeper community and indeed eventually to a structural unity of the churches in the future. Receptive ecumenism, in other words, re represents a different strategy from the model of consensus seeking, since it is less optimistic of reaching agreement in the near future, but is designed for a long-term process of paving the way towards church unity in the future. As the name indicates, receptive ecumenism grounds this strategy in the conviction that re receiving gifts from the traditions of others and learning from believers in other Christian communities can break the ice and lower the guards between church representatives who mistrust each other. Therefore, the guiding question of receptive ecumenism reads, what is it that we in our church tradition can learn and receive with integrity from the traditions of others? Receptive ecumenism therefore represents a way of discernment and decision-making that is not based on mutuality between churches of different traditions. Instead, it entails a unilateral act of listening, learning and receiving from the traditions of others in order to take well-grounded decisions in the life of one's own church. Gifts and knowledge received from others provide means for improvement and restoration of one's own church and tradition. Learning and receiving provides means for interior reform. If the search for consensus is based on a mutual process of listening and learning, receptive ecumenism represents a one-way model for listening and learning. It is an inward looking process <clears throat> which ultimately rests on the will to think self-critically, to openly confess weaknesses of one's own church and to ask one's ecumenical others for help. It presupposes um, uh, or receptive ecumenism uh, in receptive ecumenism, discernment and decision making is considered to be an act of leaning into the spirit. When considering the inward looking approach of receptive ecumenism and its starting point in the motto of arriving at a better quality disagreement, the hopes of the future church unity might appear like a very distant dream. But the representatives of receptive ecumenism insist that the way out of frozen ecumenical relationships need to start precisely on these premises in order to be successful. In fact, Nathan Söderblom in his time reasoned in similar ways. And here we see him again together with the patriarch of Alexandria. A deep going organic unity of the churches was for Söderblom also a future goal. But here and now, Christians could unite in spirituality and interiority in order to pave the way for future deep communion. But for Söderblom, there was something more which could unite the churches here and now, namely the action for healing the shattered world. For him, the need for reconciliation and reconstruction in the aftermath of the First World War was too urgent to allow time-consuming procedures about doctrines or ecclesial structures. Instead, he placed the socio-ethical issues in the foreground, and this was also the case at the Stockholm gathering in 1925 and in the succeeding Life and Work movement. The search for unity in the spirit, which is manifest in the modern ecumenical movement today 
and a century ago can be related to what Paul Davis explains for us in his book about three dimensions of Christian life. Institutional, the intellectual and the mystical. According to Avis, these dimensions correspond to three criteria of ecclesial integrity, namely conservatism, criticism and contemplation. That the institutional dimension needs to be guided by a principle of conservatism that resists passing fashions, takes a long term view and is mindful of what the church community owes to those who have gone before. Then that the intellectual dimension needs to be guided by a principle of criticism, which means to scrutinize ecclesiastical structures, to resist imperialistic claims and to call for reform. Lastly, the mystical dimension corresponds with principles for contemplation, which demonstrate that administrative efficiency um, or academic soundness are never enough, which relativize the institutional and intellectual aspects of the church, and which ask how they enhance spiritual vision and the relationship with God. Avis summarizes this discussion by stating that mere conservatism can be stifling and that mere criticism can be arid, but that it is the mystical and contemplative dimension that provides the ultimate test of a church's integrity. Still, Avis points to the importance of all of these three dimensions and principles in conciliarism. And in fact, his book primarily deals with the institutional dimension of conciliarism. He deals specifically with the way that the Western church um, has gone through what he calls a family quarrel on how this institution should be governed or of whether it should be governed by a monarchical or by a conciliar means. And he takes us on a journey through the history of Western Christianity where monarchical and conciliar models of authority have competed, not least in the time before and during the Reformation. At the same time, Avis points to how monarchical and conciliar models of authority seldom appear in pure forms and that they in fact have a lot in common. Conciliarism in the era before the Reformation did not exclude papacy but presupposed the leadership of the Pope. On top of this, Avis emphasizes that conciliar government cannot be equalized uh, with dem democratic government in the modern sense of democracy, but that it is not authoritarian either. Conciliarism, he concludes, is an inclusive and participatory form of decision making. It challenges traditionalism and resists the absolutizing of traditions. Still, conciliarism is a strong vehicle of Christian traditions since it does not allow traditions to decline into static entities. With conciliarism, traditions need to continue developing in dynamic process. Although a main part of Avis' book deals with the conflicting aspirations of monarchical and conciliar authority, he brings the limitations of this dispute to display point to its Western location, its focus on institutional government and its tendency to fall into a discourse that is dominated by juridical terminology. In the book, Avis opens up a window towards a theological terrain that brings wider perspectives to this discourse. And he does so by looking eastwards to the to the Orthodox Excuse me, is something happening here? Uh, okay, shall I continue? 
Yes, please. There was just some technical problem going on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I continue. Yeah, please. Right. Sorry for this. Thank you. Okay. Great. So, um, yes, uh, Avis he does so by looking eastwards to the Orthodox churches and to the way that the concept of Sobornost was being used in Russia in the beginning of the 20th century. According to Avis, the questions about authority, unity and primacy, which the Western tradition so widely has responded to in juridical terms, get more multifaceted answers in the Eastern tradition through the idea of Sobonost. Sobonost, he explains, points to communal solidarity and mutual mystical indwelling in love. It elevates the church as a mystery above the church as institution, and it evokes conciliarity in the sense of a community that is guided and governed by the Holy Spirit. Also, Paul Vallier turns the limelight towards the idea of Sobonost, and he points to its meaning of togetherness and fellowship, but also of its, to its meaning of cathedral. Sobonost, he says, guides the imagination towards the warm and communal feeling of a cathedral service on a great feast day. Moreover, Sobonost corresponds with the meaning of Catholic in the creed. Following Paul Vallier, the renaissance of conciliarism in the 20th century began in the Orthodox Church in Russia, and according to him, it was the call for restitution of Sobonost in the church that paved the way for this renaissance. The ecumenical meeting in Stockholm in 1925 was a step on this way. It was one of the milestones in the development of the modern ecumenical movement, which contributed to the renaissance of conciliarism in the 20th century. But if this renaissance started in the Orthodox Church in Russia, it is obvious that the Orthodox participants represented a clear minority in the ecumenical gathering in Stockholm. If we then look for Roman Catholic participants, then we look in vain. In Stockholm, the Roman Catholic representation was conspicuous by its absence. Confessionally, the representation in Stockholm was largely Protestant. Geographically, it was largely Northwestern. And talking about representation, what about the women? If we look into the photo documentary, the female presentation is not overwhelming, but it is existent. Women appear here and there. They appear among the delegates, like the Finnish deaconess Anna Nsikala. They appear in the secretariat of the meeting, like Miss Lucy Gardner, in the work of the committees, like the committee from the Siktuna Foundation. And they were indeed also among the main speakers. There were not many. Among the numerous portraits of speakers that we see here, we can find two women to the right, up to the right in the picture, the Swedish author Dr. Selma Lagerlöf and the Swedish nurse and human, humanitarian worker Dr. Elsa Brändström, who we will have reason to come back to in a little while. If we go to the continuation committee of the conference, which elaborated the organization, of the life and work movement, the female presence is, as far as we can see, zero. In order to find a crowd of women, we need to go to the administration of the work of the local sub-organizations. And here we see a picture from the Bureau of Life and Work who organized this local uh, uh, organization work. We can also note that women appear in the more informal rooms, like around the coffee tables, in the dinners, and in the open meetings in the nature. Representation 
is an important issue in conciliarism, as we learn from both Paul Vallier and Paul Avis. As we noted in the beginning of the lecture, the development of conciliarism relied on the collegiality of the clergy. But conciliarism can also mean the gathering and counseling of clergy and laity together. A council can be regular or it can meet ad hoc. It can be large and small. It can be influential and uninfluential and it can record its conversations or not. In 1925, like today, women primarily belong to the laity of the worldwide church. From the documentation of the Stockholm conference a century ago, it is obvious that women were, they were represented in the meeting itself and in the continuing labor of establishing the life and work movement, which eventually led up to the formation of the World Council of Churches. But it is also obvious that their voices were not the ones that were most frequently recorded, since their efforts did not mainly take place in the official proceedings, but remained largely in the informal rooms that surrounded and supported the conciliar work. Here it is interesting to connect to the discussions among peace and conflict researchers who in our time pay more and more attention precisely to the informal aspects of diplomacy, mediation and negotiation. In the last decades, this debate has with increasing intensity concerned the limitations of the negotiation table as the place for conflict resolution and the elaboration of shared agendas. With increasing frequency, it has been observed that high level negotiations between official representatives of parties involved in conflicts need to be complemented with efforts of informal communication in order to result in sustainable, peaceful solutions. Therefore, the discussion on diplomacy, mediation and negotiation has widened. Focus is also turned towards the possible role of agents of informal communication and their ability to prepare the way for conflict resolution by means of establishing friendly relations, building trust and creating spaces for conversations that lead people to learn more about each other and find common grounds. Here it's, it's interesting to note that the new currents in contemporary spiritual ecumenism involves a comparable engagement. It is designed to lead the conversations away from the negotiating table towards forums for learning more about each other and for building relations of trust with a long-term aspiration of reaching unity. But if we then turn back to the meaning of conciliarism, we can ask ourselves if conciliarism by definition really includes informal activities and conversations of this kind. When we read Paul Avis and Paul Vallier, <clears throat> the decision-making and organizational aspects of conciliarism are highlighted. At the same time, Avis opens the door towards a wider discussion by pointing not only to the institutional, but also to the intellectual and mystical dimensions of church life and stresses that also these dimensions are important to conciliarism. Such a widened discussion inquires also into the role of spiritual fellowship and unconditional, critical and creative dialogue. Whether informal conversations are inherent to conciliarism or not, I believe that there is a point of taking them into consideration. I agree with our colleagues in peace and conflict studies. When attending to the informal spaces in the periphery of decision-making rooms, to the conversations among agents who operate behind the scenes, the voices of a larger circle of representatives come to the fore, including the voices of women and youth. Moreover, 
when considering the common work of discernment and reflection which takes place in the hidden, we can get a more profound sense of the actual preconditions for making decisions that lead to sustainable agendas. That the resolution of conflicts and the formation of common goals are often preceded by conversations which are based in growing friendship and which allow, allow unrecorded discernment processes of thinking loud together. The documentary book Pictures and Pages from 1925 testifies to consciousness about the value of conversations of this kind. The reports and pictures from the official sessions are mixed with photos from informal gatherings that took place during the conference. When we're walking together, making day trips together, eating together, and fishing together. The picture of the conference participants who are fishing together in Ek Udden is especially interesting. It not, is not only a lovely picture, it actually tells us something important. First of all, you wouldn't go fishing with someone who you dislike. Fishing is indeed an activity that usually takes several hours. We can, in other words, assume a relaxed and friendly atmosphere at the bridge, which the picture also mediates. We can only speculate about the themes of their conversation. But what is obvious is that the Stockholm gathering had a double nat nature. While decisions were taken in plenary halls, the conference also provided another kind of environment where the participants had an opportunity to get to know each other and talk informally with each other. The Swedish historian Maria Småberg, who has studied the work of the Anglican Church in Palestine in 1920s, she points to the function of such an informal environment in the conciliary work of, uh, conciliatory work of churches. She has observed that bishops in Jerusalem at that time, when they worked for reconciliation between Jews, Muslims and Christians, used both formal and informal spaces for gathering representatives from the three religions. A typical informal space was thanks to the English tradition, the afternoon tea. In an afternoon tea, the conversations could flow more openly and if they would arrive in conclusions that could support an agreement, this conclusion could be implemented in official proceedings. If not, it would simply be referred to as an effort of common discernment, as an informal conversation among friends. In contemporary literature on religion and peace building, activities of this kind are often referred to in terms of bridge building. The concept of bridge building aims to reflect the efforts of religious agents who work for connecting believers from different traditions and who create forums where they can strengthen their relationships and deepen their understanding of each other. Bridge building, in other words, refers to a kind of work that is carried out beyond the decision making rooms. But bridge building might also have a formal implication. It might also refer to the conciliar proceedings between representatives of different faith traditions and the statements and documents that religious councils produce are concrete outcomes of this bridge building practice. These statements and documents can guide religious communities in their life and work, but they can also form a contribution to a wider societal and international debate. Bridge building between religious traditions can be a means of building relations with other also non-confessional agents in civil society. As we have seen, the meeting in Stockholm testified to the formal and to the informal dimensions of bridge building. Eventually, if we turn back to the formal proceedings of the meeting, a person who was invited to speak in plenary was Dr. Elsa Brennström. 
She has sometimes been called the Angel of Siberia, thanks to her humanitarian work among prisoners in Russia during the First World War. In her speech to the plenary, Elsa Brennström addressed precisely the issue of bridge building, and she did so against the background of her experiences as sent out by the Lutheran Church and the Red Cross among prisoners and people in deep need during the First World War. In other words, her speech adds yet a dimension to the notion of bridge building, namely the capacity of religious agents to build bridges that cross national divisions. And I will now share a few contributions from her speech that I've freely translated from Swedish to English. She said, narrower our horizons are, the more fronts are we fighting on and the more prejudices do we have. The wider our horizons are, the more tolerant do we develop and the better possibilities do we create for acquiring a just understanding of each other. In the face of national enmity, the magic formula is to get to know each other and honor each other. Only by means of honest effort to get to know each other and feel with one another can we pave the way for sympathy. In order to create harmony between people, heads of the bridges that we build need to be constructed by knowledge and understanding. Trust and commitment are the pillars that underpin the work for love and reconciliation between peoples. However, the work of building constructive and compassionate international relations presupposes a mindset of self-scrutiny. We can hear that Elsa Brennström's insights are kindred with and echo the insights that were made by Christians from another church tradition. And here I'm thinking of the Orthodox church leaders who composed the letter from Constantinople only a few years earlier. And then also against the backdrop of the horrors of war. As we read in the beginning of this lecture, they wrote in this encyclical that, above all, love should be rekindled and strengthened among the churches so that they should no more consider one another as strangers and foreigners, but as relatives and as being part of the household of Christ. And by stirring up a rightly brotherly interest in the condition, the well-being and stability of, of the other churches, by readiness to take an interest in what is happening in those churches, and to obtain a better knowledge of them, and by willingness to offer mutual aid and help, many good things will be achieved. To conclude then, we can also see that these insights were not only echoed across geographical locations and people of different church traditions 100 years ago, the echo of these insights also reach into our own time. When scholars of theology, religion, peace and conflict try to discern the resources of religious agents and elaborate on their possible contributions to overcome national enmity and polarization in society, many of them do so with a view to the same issues that were addressed by Elsa Brennström and the Synod in Constantinople. The need for deeper knowledge about each other, the need for getting to know each other, the willingness of giving mutual aid and help, and the readiness to take on a self-critical mindset. And they emphasize the need to bring together formal and informal initiatives of religious agents for these purposes. In the contemporary interdisciplinary discussion, these issues are largely addressed in terms of a faith-based diplomacy. But this concept opens up the window towards yet another field, which I will not address today, but which I will talk more about in my next lecture on global engagement in April. So uh, I have to thank you. I just want to add that uh, Bishop uh, 
Bishop uh, Makari, the Romanian bishop, so he has gathered the, the exchange of letters between uh, Archbishop Söderblom and the Orthodox hierarchs uh, in a book published here some years ago. So this is a high topic and we are heading towards 2025. So it's a very relevant topic that you pre presented here in connection with conciliarism and democracy. So thank you so much, uh, Sara. And uh, we'll see you again during the spring. So we'll, you'll be back in, on the screen, not in the room, but on the screen. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, by th these words, I say goodbye. But I do think that Boyan will present the next lecture, right? Yes, precisely. Uh, I just wanted to announce the next lecture, which is going to be on Thursday, March 18th when Dr. Adriana Bara will present on the ministry in the church. And uh, since uh, we're having open day uh, at Enhulda uh, Högskål in Stockholm uh, or University College Stockholm, uh, that will also be part of that event. So uh, March 18th, it is the same time. And Dr. Adriana Bara, thank you so much for today.